Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to be with you. I think it was two or three years ago that I had the blessing and opportunity to, uh, to be with you here at a previous conference and enjoyed the fellowship uh, very much as, as well as the, the lectures that were given. If you're interested, you could turn to the back of our blue psalter to page 100, I'm sorry, page 96, uh, where the canons of Dort are located. And I would just point out that at the beginning of uh, the canons, actually before the preface, there's a wonderful summary in history of, <clears throat> of the, um, the synod itself and something about the, the delegates and the articles that Pastor Serafini already spoke about, about the remonstrance. Um, but it's a, a wonderful piece of, of history to give context to it. And I will pl I'll plan on giving a little bit of that context very um, uh, shortly. Uh, the most important sentence in all of the canons of Dort is found in um, article 14 of Head 1. And in that article, our fathers declared that this doctrine is for the glory of God, and then here's the important line, and for the enlivening and comforting of His people. Over the centuries, many would say that this has not been their experience. And perhaps no other doctrine has given souls more trouble, uh, more sleepless nights, more anxiety than, than this one. And yet, that was not the intent of the framers of the canons. In fact, this is a very pastoral formula. It is meant for the believer's comfort. It is meant for their joy in believing. Our beloved canons comprise one-third of what the continental Reformed churches consider to be the three forms of unity. And while there are three standards around which the church gathers and confesses as the summary of the of the Christian faith, many don't know its teachings, at least as they should know them, because they are for the believer's comfort. We often compare the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism with the Heidelberg Catechism, and rightly we would say that the Westminster document is more precise in its its, its teaching, its, its idiom, and that the Heidelberg Catechism is more practical and warm and personal. But I've come to a, a personal opinion myself, and that is that the canons are the most pastoral, comforting, and revitalizing of all the Reformed confessional creeds. And I'm so pleased that Kenelon HRC has chosen this body of writing to be the subject of this conference. A little about the history uh, before we begin, I feel I should bring something of that just simply because I'm the, the first speaker. Dort, as you all know, is uh, short for Dortrecht, a port city in Holland. As Pastor Serafini already mentioned, it uh, was the convening in 1618 and 19 of an international synod gathered to address the, uh, in the Dutch churches an error that was stemming from a deeply loved Reformed minister and professor by the name of Jacobus Arminius. He had since passed away, uh, but his, his acolytes picked up the torch that he had laid, get, laid down, and they began to, to light the, the fires of error among the Dutch churches. And that fire uh, being that man was not totally depraved, the atonement of Christ was conditional, Christ's death was unlimited in its scope, that any sinner could resist or reject salvation, and finally, that it is possible that a soul that was once saved could, in fact, be lost at last. The first head of doctrine of divine predestination is my uh, subject tonight as we uh, begin together. And the first thing that I want to do is speak to you a little bit about original sin. And children, just so you know, I will be dealing with the T 
uh, on your handout, uh, Total Depravity. It'll be a, a portion, and I'll have a, a short um, illustration for you, and maybe you will be able to remember what total depravity is after that illustration. And while total depravity underlies all of the first head of doctrine, it by no means exhausts the first head of doctrine. Original sin is uh, the birth of our trouble, but it is manifestly clear that this doctrine and many others essential to the Christian faith also stem from it. And so the question we could ask tonight is, what is total depravity? Does total depravity mean that fallen man is evil incarnate? Or that fallen man is absolutely depraved? Children, I want you to imagine that that up here I'm holding a, a clean glass of water. The purest water that that we could possibly find. And then I was to take just a a dropper, like you would with a science project, and just take one drop of of arsenic, that's a poison, and just one drop into that glass. And then that drop of arsenic just begins to permeate every part of that glass of water. How much of that glass of water would be poisonous? To the eye, when you look at it, you would probably see really no no difference at all. And yet, would all of that water be poisonous? Every bit and all of the molecules intermingling with one another, would, would that become a poisonous glass of water? Well, that's true. That's exactly what what that is. It's all contaminated. It is totally contaminated. That's the illustration of total depravity. Sin has permeated every aspect of our being, every part of our human condition. But absolute depravity, children, would be something different. It would be that same glass full of that poison. And that is why we hold to, as Scripture teaches, that man is totally depraved, not absolutely depraved. This mean, that means that all of man's being, his thought, his words, his actions, his physiology is tainted, infected by sin. He's not absolutely depraved. Because the Bible also teaches that we are image bearers of God. Though marred, that image still remains in us of Him. And this is the fundamental understanding of of what the followers of Arminius believe. That man is born a clean glass of water and there is enough purity within man to choose the saving good that is offered in the gospel over the condemning bad, that man's total faculty was not corrupted by sin. In a sense, we could say that that man is in in the mind of, of Arminius, especially his followers, that man is in co control of his eternal destiny. But of course, countless texts in the Word of God teach the contrary. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Ephesians 2 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The psalmist confesses in Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, the Psalms in 58.3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. John 6.65, and he said, therefore, I say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans 3 also says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so with this principle in mind, with this idea in mind, the first head of doctrine was written, which speaks predominantly about election. The interesting thing about the first head of doctrine is if you're paying close attention to it, it really is a summary of all five heads of doctrine. Every subject is, is touched upon within it. And we read this in the first head of doctrine, that God for His own purpose and wise counsel chose to take from this fallen mass of humanity a people for His Son. As Revelation 9 tells us, even a great multitude which no man can number of all nations, all kindreds and people and tongues before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And of course, this is speaking of the bride of Christ made white in the blood of the Lamb. And one day, that bride will be perfected in number. That the last person that God has elected unto salvation will believe and repent and turn unto Christ. And that bride will be completed. And then we know that the Lord will soon return. The question is, how does one become part of that number? Arminius taught, essentially, that we can, we can help our, ourselves out there. There's another theologian, a neo-Orthodox theologian by the name of Karl Barth, and he taught, for instance, that election was like a ship that's sailing to heaven. And you could get on that ship, and you could get off that ship by your own free will, or you could be thrown off by sin and then reboard it again by repentance and faith. So salvation, Christ is the ship that's going to heaven, and, and by repentance and faith you get on, but by sin you can get off and back on again, off again, as the ship travels on its way. As a young man, uh, I was an Arminian, and I was a bona fide five-point Arminian. And I really believed what Bart had described. For instance, when, when I read of the Lamb's Book of Life in Revelation, where the names of the elect are, are recorded, I wondered how that worked exactly. And I guess I believe that I believed that, that Christ uh, sort of used a, a pencil. I repent and believe, and He writes my name in His book. And then I sin, and He flips that pencil over, and He erases my name. And then I repent again, and He turns the pencil over again, and He puts my name in the book, back and forth, back and forth. And I, I found that very that idea very discouraging. And I clearly remember uh, one minister preaching in a sermon on a Sunday evening after what was considered to be a revival meeting. Um, and he said, if you leave today, you better live holy. Because you could leave this room as a child of God, but if you sin, you could step off the curb and you could get hit by a bus and you'd be lost. 
You can imagine how that plays on the mind of, of, a, young, of a young man for fear. But back to the subject, how does one become part of, of that number of the elect? It's interesting that our Dort fathers waste no time in laying out the means. It's in Articles 2 and 3 already that we first hear about God sending His Son for sinners. Even those who weren't looking for salvation in any way, those who were heart enemies to God with murderous thoughts in their minds about God, with a clenched fist in the face of God, And that is through the heralding of the gospel and the receiving by the ear in faith. And one is delivered from the wrath of God. This is all in in Articles 2 and 3. They're already at the very beginning laying out the, the, the way in which one may be born again. That still doesn't tell us how we know we are elect. Article 5 teaches us that the guilt of unbelief is not the fault of God. And Heads 3 and 4, Articles 8 and 9 are going to lay that out in a a beautiful way. That the guilt of unbelief is not the fault of God, but it is actually the fault of man himself. And that's a very important piece of information. However, we also learn that faith that saves is not something that we possess naturally. So it's... It's my fault if I don't believe, but the gift of faith is what I need, and who's the dispenser of that gift? Ephesians 2 says, And unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to hear that that gift of faith, it's the gift of God, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And I suppose in one sense we're getting closer to the answer to the question, how are the elect chosen? Or how do I know if I am elect? It's actually not until Article 6 that we begin to see the answer, which says that some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not receive it. It proceeds from God's eternal decree. For known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world, Acts 15, 18. Who worketh all things after the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1, 11. According to which decree He graciously softens the heart of the elect, however obstinate, and inclines them to believe, while He leaves the non-elect in His just judgment to their own wickedness and obduracy. And children, the word obduracy there is stubbornness. Well, that tells us a little bit more, doesn't it? And Article 7 then begins to sharpen the the point. Election is the unchangeable purpose of God, whereby uh, before the foundation of the world, He hath out of mere grace, according to the sovereign good pleasure of His own will, chosen from the whole human race which had fallen through their own fault from their primitive state of rectitude into sin and destruction, a certain number of persons to redemption in Christ, whom He from eternity appointed the mediator and head of the elect and the foundation of salvation. There are not various decrees of election as the Arminians taught, but one, as Article 8 tells us. Election is not founded on foreseen faith or the obedience of faith, as as I was taught. We find that actually in Article 9. But as Article 10 tells us, it comes from God's good pleasure. His pleasure is the sole cause of election. That He has chosen out of His own good pleasure who will and who will not be saved. And that brings us actually to uh, the subject of 
double predestination. And we who are in the Reformed faith believe in double predestination. Because not only is the doctrine of divine predestination speaking about those who have been elected unto everlasting life, but it is also speaking about those who do not. And if we read very carefully, we learn something quite important about this. And so the first head of doctrine doesn't omit the dark side of election, of reprobation or double predestination. And we do need to touch on it as a piece of the doctrine of election. Article 4 says this, The wrath of God abideth on those who believe not the gospel. So the key word there is the word abideth. And then Article 6 states this, that some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not receive it. It proceeds from God's eternal decree. For known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, according to which decree He graciously softens the heart of the elect, however obstinate, and inclines them to believe while He leaves the non-elect in his just judgment to their own wickedness and stubbornness. This is what we confess as uh, Reformed churches. We confess these two articles especially speak of both sides of divine predestination, of double predestination. But at the same time, however, this doctrine often leaves us with many questions regarding double predestination. And the first is this, why does it say in the canons, leaves the non-elect in his just judgment? And then use words like, abideth upon. Why not fall upon? Abide, something is to abide, it is to remain, it is to continue. It is to stay. To fall means to uh, to send down upon. But here the word is abide. The wrath of God abides on them. Some very godly people believe that God actively elects to heaven and actively elects others to hell. Even my second favorite Puritan, Samuel Rutherford, thankfully not Brockle, or I'd probably have to switch teams. But our Dort Fathers taught that God does not actively reprobate anyone. Though He does actively elect to salvation. Let me give you an illustration. And I I realize in crafting this illustration, it only goes so far but I think it will give us a sense of the, of the language of our, of our canons when it says, remaineth or abideth, he leaves them in their just condemnation. We often have interesting discussions around uh, the dinner table in the Lewis house after, after dinner. And here's one situational ethics question that came up. So you can imagine this for yourself. You're standing alone along a railroad track in front of a a high bridge over a canyon. And just where you're standing, the the tracks split into two. They, They parse into two different directions before you. And the building of the bridge over the canyon isn't complete yet. And it has a 500 foot drop off Uh, into the ravine. The train has 200 people coming towards you as they think they're making their way to their destination. And then you look 100 yards down the other track and you see that there's a person who's tied to the rails. And as you look below you or next to you, you see that there's a switch. And you recognize that if you pull that switch one way, 
The train will divert, the, path, uh, uh, the, the tracks will be diverted from the course over the bridge and will be diverted onto that track where that one single person is. All you have to do is pull the lever and 200 souls would be saved. In other words, you're letting it abide if you leave the track as is. Doing so will surely then kill this person, this one person who's tied to the track. You are, if I can put it to you like this, you're you're making it a a decision, a, a moral decision. And you're going to make it either actively or passively. The question around the dinner table was, what do you do? And there are only two answers. One, don't touch the lever. Don't touch the switch. Let it abide as you found it. And let the train go on toward its destination. And obviously you would save the one that is tied up. Or the second possibility. Flick the switch or pull the lever and save the 200 and kill the one man. Here is an active and passive situation. And I use this illustration because I want you to, uh, to, to know or I would like to make you aware of something uh, all through the canons of Dort. There's this language when it comes to the reprobate. And the language is always passive. It's always abide. It's always to continue. Over and over again, that language is used. And this will become important. Because when it comes to reprobation in the determining of those who go to hell, God is passive, not active, according to the canons. The wrath of God abideth upon them, Article 4 says. It means God's wrath was already upon them collectively in the fall, in Adam, as it was on all mankind. It means that God concluded all under sin in Adam. The same goes for the wording of Article 6 at the end. It remains on them. It abides where it is. He leaves them in their sin. As the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, all all mankind by their fall lost communion with God and are under His wrath and curse. In Adam's fall, if if I can say it like this, God saw the full train of human existence on the tracks of total depravity heading for the cliffs of eternal destruction. That's what abideth here means. It's already true. All of humanity is under the wrath and curse of God. That we were all going there. And then out of the single fallen mass of humanity, God the Father actively chose some to eternal life and passively let the others abide in their way of sin and rebellion, which they love. He actively predestinates to heaven, but he passively predestinates to hell. That's what Article 15 is is going to say. And this is the decree of reprobation, which by no means makes God the author of sin, the very thought of which is blasphemy, but declares Him to be an awful, irreprehensible, and righteous judge and avenger thereof. In that article, they are summarizing that doctrine. That He is not the author of sin. That when all mankind by their fall lost communion with God and were under His wrath and curse, He let humanity abide in that condition 
which will end in his just judgment. But from that fallen mass, he will elect some to everlasting life. And our fathers knew that the great criticism of Arminianism, which they stated emphatically, said, you Calvinists charge God with sin. You make him the author of sin. And some do that even today, which our Dort fathers say is blasphemy. God in His wisdom, if I can use the illustration again, and poorly, no doubt, God doesn't need the lever. He could save all on the train and the man tied up. Or He could, for just reasons, save none. Or He could lift out as many as He chooses from the train and set them in safety, leaving the rest to go where they had determined to go themselves. And here is where the why and how questions fill our mind, don't they? Many of them I don't have the answer for. I don't think anyone does. Because who can know the mind of the Lord? In other words, when we have a a secret question about fairness and and so on. Questions about why the one and, and not the other. The only answer the Bible and the canons give is this. God knows why. God knows why. And that the difficulty lies with us, not God. Not God. Our unbelief also lies with us, not God. Our own sin lies with us, not God. I remember over 30 years ago now when I was first introduced to divine predestination as an Arminian. Uh, The man who introduced the doctrines of, of grace to me would later on become my, my minister in the Scottish Presbyterian Church. That would be years later. But how I fought against it. With, with all of my might, I fought against it. And my teacher's patience and love and ultimately the grace of God turning my heart is what changed me. When I began to see just a little of what the Bible had to say about my heart, the Spirit started showing me something of my own darkness. Over the course of two years, I believe that the Lord did a saving work in my life. In fact, I don't know where I would be today if it were not for this doctrine being applied to my heart and to my life. And it didn't end a road before me as much as it opened up a new road called the New and Living Way. Then I began to have my doubts too. Reverend D. Beatty, who was my teacher and then my pastor, told me that to believe in justification by faith is not to justify. Neither does believing in the doctrine of divine predestination make one elect. Demons believe too, he told me from James, and tremble. He introduced me to an 18th century theologian, Robert Sandeman, who taught that the nature of saving faith is reduced to mere intellectual assent to a proposition. That all you had to do is know the doctrine and understand the doctrine and believe the doctrine to be true for one to be saved. Beware of Sandemanism, Gerald, Reverend Beatty said to me. 
You see, election is not found in a doctrine any more than a vacation is found in a picture. And the Lamb's book of life is not so much a book as it is a person. It's upon Christ crucified. It's upon the hands of Christ crucified that the names of the elect are engraved. And to know one's election is to know Christ. And to know Him as a bleeding Savior for sin. And so then personal faith and personal repentance and a full-bodied weight leaning on all that He is and all that He has done in His person and His work is what's needed in approaching knowing. And so the sentiments of Had One Article 13 became very important to me. And I wish I could say that I did a, a better job than I did. Article 13 encourages the child of God to a holy life by election. The sense and certainty of this election afford to the children of God additional matter for daily humiliation before Him, for adorning the depths of His mercies, for cleansing themselves and rendering grateful returns of ardent love to Him who first manifests so great love toward them. The consideration of this doctrine of election is so far from encouraging remissness in the observance of the divine commands or from sinking men into carnal security that these, in the just judgment of God, are the useful effects of rash presumption or of idle wantonness and trifling with the grace of election in those who refuse to walk in the way of the elect. It's not a doctrine. It's in a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. And there's an activity then of faith that springs from this truth. Of course, which Head 5 will demonstrate. That discourages inactivity and condemns unbelief. And commends a lively, outgoing faith of good works as one proof of your election. So that God, according to His grace, elects some to salvation and a holy life, and He leaves others in their sin and just judgment because it pleases Him to do so. Election is definitely enlivening, as the article says. When we see our own unworthy nothingness over against Christ's person and work. And to truly believe in the doctrines of divine predestination, we must personally, in a sense, look past the doctrine of divine predestination to the cross. That we must cease from man, which also means trusting in the horsemen and chariots of good dogma. But rest simply and entirely upon the finished work of Christ. That's hard to do. Because that means I have to cease from self. And ceasing from self is the only way comfort can be gained from the doctrine of divine predestination. Children, let me tell you about three young men. All three believed in divine predestination and believed that they were elect for varying reasons and to varying degrees. And they each wanted to protect themselves from doubt because they had heard that giant despair of doubting castle was pursuing them. 
And so they all decided we will build a shelter against him. The first young man built a shelter out of what he found out later was the hay and the stubble of philosophy. He gathered together all of the great minds of the past of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and Immanuel Kant and Freud and Erickson and Piaget and all of the best modern minds that he could find. Reason, then, would become his defense against all doubt. And so he went inside. But when giant despair from Doubting Castle came, he smashed down that shelter. The second young man made his out of wood. He gathered sticks of religion, Hinduism, Taoism, Judaism, Islam, every ism you could think of, uh, even Joe Roganism and, and Jordan Petersonism and, and all of the experts on TikTok and YouTube and Reels. And he went inside. The giant despair from Doubting Castle came to his shelter too and destroyed it. The last young man, he looked at the other two buildings in shambles and he decided that he was going to build his house against doubt out of something better, out of the, out of the bricks of the Word of God. And so he used the, the bricks of Scripture, graciousness, patience, kindness, long-suffering, charity, chastity, prayer, Bible reading, the preaching of the Word, baptism, and even the Lord's Supper. And he was quite confident that when when giant despair of Doubting Castle came to him, that he would be saved. The giant also tore down that shelter. Because children, young people, safety is not found in a structure of any kind. It is found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 247 says, O God, our help in ages past, our hope in years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Even the stormy blast of doubt is only found in God our helper. Christ is the shelter. In Him are the clefts of the rock. That his wounds are our hiding place. And that is where why, that is the where and why the elect, where they may take comfort and where they may rest. That election is an encouraging, comforting doctrine because it teaches that a, a poor worm like me can do nothing to be saved. Christ has done it all. And it is only in Him, by the, as a fruit of faith, that election could ever become precious. In certain circles, there are those who, who, who say the promises are so beautiful in Christ. The, 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 the work of Christ is precious. The person of Christ is precious. But he only died for the elect. And oh, if I only knew that I was one of them, then I could believe. But dear one, if you think that way, you're trying to peer into the secret counsel of God. But we know what the Scriptures tell us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so divine predestination is a comfort. 
if I have believed upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I have repented of my sins, then I can't go lost, and I would go lost. And Christ's sacrifice is more than sufficient for my circumstances. And then that gospel of salvation is held out freely to any hearer under the sound of that precious word. To know that He will not only draw me and save me, He will keep me even to the very end. Sovereign ruler of the skies, ever gracious, ever wise, all my times are in thy hands, all events at thy command. His decree who formed the earth fixed my first and second birth, parents, place of birth and time, all appointed were by him. Thee at all times will I bless, having thee I all possess. What in truth a loss can be, since thou, O Lord, will not part from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Lewis. We very much appreciate you bringing that. And indeed, what a matter of praise eternally for us to praise the Lord. Um, so I'm going to close in prayer this session. Uh, I just want to announce uh, before I pray that uh, there are, we're going to take a half an hour break. We'll reconvene at 830, um, and there are refreshments uh, to enjoy with some fellowship together. And we're very grateful that you are all here. So let's close this session in prayer. Our marvelous Lord, thou who art sovereign, who has chosen us from all eternity, O oh Lord, who can fathom the God that thou art, that thou in thy infinite wisdom, in thy boundless love, hast chosen a people unto thyself, Lord, we who were dead in our sins and trespasses, who were lying in our, in our blood, Lord, we who were enemies and rebels by nature, and yet thou dost pluck us as brands from the burning. Oh, we praise thee, Lord, and we will praise thee forever and ever, Lord, for thy goodness and grace and for thy sovereign love over us. We thank thee, Lord, for the doctrine of election that is so clear in thy word. Lord, it is our anchor. It is our hope. Lord, without it, we would be lost. Without thy electing power in our lives, we pray, Lord, that it would never be a hindrance to anyone in this room. Lord, that it would only be a matter of comfort that there is a way of salvation because of thy divine election. And so, Lord, may we be encouraged by this doctrine and may we, uh, may, may we live our lives in godliness and in gratitude, Lord, for thy power in our lives. Bless us as we enjoy fellowship together, Lord, and we thank thee for everyone here. Lord, what a joy to have so many churches represented that we may be gathered together as the body of Christ and see a little bit of the unity that is in Christ. We thank thee for it, and we thank thee for one another. Bless us as we enjoy this time together and be f with us further in this conference. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you're dismissed. Thank you.